So everybody, welcome to the show. And we are so like excited, Serena and I, to have Dr. Lindsay Berkson. It's like a Father Christmas coming to children on Christmas. It's like, we're excited. (laughs) Oh, we are. (laughs) Because you are an absolute um, hormone specialist. um, And you are doing an amazing thing in this world. You are vindicating estrogen. Oh my goodness, about time. We just want to sit at your feet, pick your brain today, share the amazing Mm. benefits of estrogen that you know so eloquently and the fears um, but but let's read your your bio, your official oh. one, so everyone can know who you are. I hope it's not long. My bio's <laughs> long. You should shorten it up. <laughs> Dr. Lindsay Berkson specializes in complex cases and high risk hormonal patients. Dr. Burson knows how to connect the dots of cutting edge research and has a large background of personal clinical experience with success and difficult cases to pull from. She's a thought leader with robust clinical, academic and scientific background going back to the 1970s and the author of, like we were talking about, Estrogen Vindicated, an incredible book. She has a consultancy and practice that is known the world over. Yeah. So, so Dr. Berkson, um, I've read your ebook, Estrogen Vindicated. I would recommend that for every woman on this planet to have a read of. I truly do. It is foundational for getting rid of the fear of estrogen. But before we go into all those things I want to cover today, Serena, I, I'll, and we're going to keep our try and keep our you know our mouths zipped up because we're talkaholics, but we want to sit at your feet. And so we. That's will what we say best. we want to do, but we will butt in. But can you tell us your story? Um, well, why first you were of here? All, the yes. biggest deal is that I just turned seventy-five. What? You look amazing! Oh my goodness! You you're and most amazing. of my colleagues are not doing well. Yeah. Mm. Every aging picks up speed with every decade. Wow. So aging is faster when you're thirty-eight than it is when you're twenty-eight. Yeah. It's faster when you're forty-eight than it is when you're thirty-eight. But it's extremely difficult once you get into your mid 60s to your 70s, unless you've had strategies with which to figure out what are your weakest links in your health and how to shore them up and how to stay younger longer. Mm. And it's for most women, not 100 percent, because nothing in medicine is 100 percent. Everything has to be individualized. And I know that there's a wonderful colleague of mine who's 102 years old, Dr. Gladys McGeary, and still seeing patients at 102. Wow. And she's not on hormone replacement. Mm. Yes. But most women can't really make a successful health journey without being on hormones. Yet at the same time in the United States, we promote birth control pills. Mm. There are 30 million women around the world on birth control pills. And they're the number one cause of why younger women are getting breast cancer. There's no study that does not confirm that birth control pills, because they're synthetic estrogen, ethanyl estradiol, in synthetic progestins, and they're swallowed because the way that you take a hormone into your body affects Mm -hmm. how it's metabolized by your body. There's no study that does not link the ingestion of birth control pills with an increased risk, a significant increased risk, what we call a statistical significant increased risk of breast cancer, which the studies have been done. If you're on birth control pills for five years, we know that that risk continues five years after you even go off of it. And there's no studies run now on the duration of the risk in women who go on birth control pills for 20 or 30 years. And in the last few years, I've been specializing in breast cancer patients and renal patients. And the majority of them, not all, because nothing is exactly the same across all domains in health, but the majority of them have had been taking birth control pills for a very long period of time. Wow. Why is wow. medicine promoting birth control pills when they're denying natural bioidentical hormones to aging women? So there's something very wrong here. Mm-hmm. And very few women, the biggest part of my story is that I get to have this energy and this vitality. I'm still working full time when wow. most of my sisters of my heart aren't like this. And when I was young, I had cancer after cancer was ill 
many, many times over and had you. many physicians. Yes. Well, tell, tell us what you talk about. I had um, breast there's cancer. There's a reason, right? Oh. Yeah. Uh, so when I was younger, I very early on bumped into, so to speak, the gurus of organic gardening and of mindfulness. So I went to India, lived in India, became a yoga teacher, did forgiveness, did detox, ate organic foods. When I went to um, medical schools uh, where I went to naturopathic school and chiropractic school after I got my master's in nutrition, before I became a scientist, I uh, had my own gardens for each season. I raised my own goats and I just kept getting cancer. Mm. So it, I was oh. doing everything right. Yeah but getting the wrong outcomes. Wow. And I was so ill because every time I had another tumor, they would take out that organ and contiguous tissue. Oh. I was told by many docs, you just have to suck it up. You were born with a lemon body. You're never going to be really healthy. Oh. And that's just how it is. And through much research and actually deciding to write one of the very first books on endocrine disruption, which are pollutants that surround the earth and present in our air, food, and water, but can disrupt our hormones. Mm. That My book was called Hormone Deception. I started to meet a lot of the original researchers in that field, and I got invited to be a distinguished hormone scholar at an estrogen think tank at Tulane University, uh, connected with Xavier Universities. And I worked with the physicians and scientists who discovered how hormones work and discovered the first receptors. Elwood Jensen discovered ER alpha, Yanaki Gustafson from the Karolinska Institute discovered ER beta. And I have this very interesting background. And I started to discover that in the laboratory, animals exposed to a certain model compound that we all learned about endocrine disruption from and that compound is called diethylstabesterol. So that is the number one most well-known endocrine disruptor that, that exists. And it's 50 times more powerful than our own homemade or endogenous 17-beta estradiol, which is our main estrogen. And the animals in the scientist laboratories that I got to meet and hang with that were exposed in the womb, they didn't consume this endocrine disruptor, DES is the acronym or nickname for it themselves, but their mothers, the the, the rodents, the maternal rodent would yeah. ingest it or the hamster would ingest it or the mm. monkey would ingest it, had all the same tumors and health issues that I did. So I, I was thinking, wow, maybe I'm doing everything right, but getting the wrong outcome because not everything is based on mindfulness and food and exercise. Yeah. There are other things at play that dictate our health, mm -hmm. especially how our genes are set up when we are in utero or in oh. our mother's belly. Yeah. So I wrote away for my mother's microfish birth records and I got them miraculously right before they were shredded and eventually Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, where I was born, closed down. So I got a hold of my mother's oh. birth, birth records before they were shredded and ruined. And right there, I could see that my mother was given an injection of diethylstabesterol multiple times in the first trimester, which is the most vulnerable trimester. Oh. And there were 365 prenatal vitamin formulas where everybody thought that this estrogen was the newest thing since sliced bread. And it would make a normal pregnancy even better. Mm. So this chemical, which was later banned in 1971 as the most cancer-causing chemical oh. ever invented, was placed in prenatal vitamins, 365 prenatal vitamins. And the offspring that were exposed to many of those prenatal vitamins or also got an injection, which they would give if a woman started to spot and she threatened to have a miscarriage. Yeah. Um, those women born to the, the mothers that were given that when pregnant by the doctors that were thinking they were doing a good thing, those women couldn't have children. I could not have children. That's why I have so many books because I couldn't have kids. <laughs> yeah. And I had cancer after cancer after cancer, even though I was living in the way that most people 
begin to right. live once they get a diagnosis yes. of cancer. Oh my goodness, can I ask you a question? So yeah. I, wow. at this point, many of us have heard of the DES babies, right? And, and you are one of them in front of us because it is the most cancer-causing um, substance. That, you that know, they known. don't, I'm glad you've heard of it because they no longer teach about it in med school or naturopathic school no, or I had read. school. I'm a nerd. I had read about it. <laughs> I'm and so, so glad you know about it. <laughs> yes, that. no, I had read about it and here you are. Now, have you, obviously you found out th about this yourself. Have you um, no researched? No doctor ever asked me. Yeah, ever. I, no. <gasps> have you researched into the other babies that were born um, to oh, these mothers? Oh, of course. Yes. It, uh, the reason, um, so the scientist that I worked, that I had the honor of working with a Tulane, especially John McLaughlin, who headed the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, where I worked, they, un they pulled apart the DES story. They were able to figure out that this was causing very rare, rare vaginal, it was called a clear cell uh, vaginal adenocarcinoma, very rare mm. vaginal cancer that was occurring in 14, 15, 16, 17 year old girls. Oh. And nobody knew why this cluster of young girls had this very rare vaginal cancer. So John happened to be, at that time, everybody thought that the womb was separate from the rest of a woman's body. So doctors said you could smoke, you could drink alcohol. In fact, doctors promoted smoking for 40 years, even yeah. long after we knew smoking caused cancer. So I have a very difficult time understanding that we get so won over by the marketing of doctors. I mean, yeah. stop it. You know, they do, the way that doctors are presently trained is not to really figure out, unfortunately, how to get you well, but it's more to figure out what medicine or pharmaceutical might be helpful. And that's right. not true of all doctors. Of course. But, but when I go to doctors now, because we all need doctors for all of our body parts, especially as we age, none of my doctors have ever heard of DES. Really? None of oh. them. Oh, and the, I, there were 38 million pregnant women given mm, DES and wow. none of our doctors know about it. I get that, like three or four calls to me. Yes. yes. It's shocking. I, I need I, to, I need to hear like, how did you, if the goat's milk in the gardens for every season didn't help you, how are you sitting here? At your age, looking so thriving, I, I, I want to, the, the filling of the gap needs to be done for me. Well, first of all, I had to figure out what, how does DES cause cancer in its offspring? So I really did mm -hmm. long conversations with Retha Newbold, who was one of the major researchers at Research Triangle Park on DES and their theories of why it was causing mm -hmm. in the offspring many issues from infertility mm -hmm. to cancers to disinsulinism to multiple issues, which what is what we're now, the young American woman has an average of several hundred chemicals in her amniotic fluid. A healthy American young woman, mm. Mount Sinai has done this research a number of decades ago. So the average baby in the United States born is exposed to so many endocrine disrupting chemicals that it's almost as if they're bathed in diethylstabestrol because all of these have synergy and additivity and, and you really need to figure out how to detox before you get pregnant. And so I've been trying to champion green pregnancies, but that's another, because you have to figure out a way to reduce exposure, mm -hmm. but nobody could figure out how to help me. And pretty much I heard over and over again, you're not getting any younger. You were born with a lemon body. If life is a book, you're in the last chapters of your book. This is in my 40s and early 50s that doctors were speaking to me like this. So I realized early on, I couldn't couldn't depend on them if I wanted to figure out if you're ill, you want to figure out how to get well. Yeah, you don't want to figure out how to just maintain yourself on medicines and get learned helplessness. You want to if if you're willing to do whatever it takes, because you're a hedonist like myself, and you want to enjoy this gift of life. And I've never been one to, to take a negative dictum as though that were set in stone and there's no way around it. So I talked to Retha Newbold and um, she was doing the experiments and showing that all of these hamsters and rodents that were exposed in utero, meaning in the womb to DES, were getting all these cancers. And um, 
in the papers that they wrote, her and her colleagues theorized that exposure to DES or a plethora of endocrine disruptors could tamp down the genes as you grew up that affect your grand dam tumor suppressor gene called P53 tumor suppressor gene. That's your main tumor suppressor compound in your body that has eyes to see a cancer cell when it shows up mm. and alert your immune system to shut it up. So the theory was that DES tamp down tumor suppressor genes and later on i was to also find as i just as i had to battle blindness because it, i also was battling i actually applied to med school and got into med school but right at that time i started being diagnosed with going irreversibly blind from the oh. same thing again the des and mm. i discovered that there were more molecules that i call the molecules of mass destruction in DES offspring's mm. bodies. And then I had to figure out what to do with all that. So here I was with a bunch of bad molecules in my body and a faulty tumor suppressor gene. And nobody would, of course, know what to do. So I became a scientist by working at Tulane and all the re research I've ended up doing and going on to do quite a bit of scientific research. But I just looked for what would if you have a faulty tumor suppressor gene, which basically most people that have cancer have faulty tumor suppressor genes. Okay. I mean, that's not the only mechanism, but that, that gene's supposed to protect you. And if you get cancer, most likely mm. it's not watching your physiologic back. Mm. So I sleuthed the literature, the peer review literature, for what might reboot the P53 grand am tumor suppressor gene. And it turned out to be the final metabolite of estrogen that's methylated called 2-methoxyestradiol or 2-MEO. And the nickname is 2-MEO, but the long polysyllabic term is 2-methoxy because it's methylated estradiol. So it comes from estrogen, but it doesn't act on the estrogen receptor. It doesn't signal estrogen. Yeah. But if you look at all the actions of 2-MEO, it sounds exactly like a natural, it sounds like a perfect chemothera chemotherapy medication. Wow. And, and there were a number of scientists for quite a number of years that were trying to put 2-MEO or a form of it because to open up a company in the United States and pay for a drug to go through regulatory action of the FDA is multiple millions of dollars. So they usually, to patent a molecule, they alter that molecule. So it's mm -hmm. no longer bioidentical, yeah. but it's altered right. so that they can really own that molecule. So if they're putting millions of dollars and years into it, they can make money for the people who invest in their companies. So there were companies that were trying to um, come out with 2-MEO as a cancer drug. And wow. there's there's many, many articles on it. And they did originally use it for intractable, meaning people who were no, getting no success with regular mm -hmm. intervention for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And wow. they had a great deal of success, but this altered form of the molecule made women very ill. It was very nauseating oh. that even Zofran wouldn't help. Wow. So I just decided to go on an, my own bioidentical a formula for it. So I had a physician friend of mine, Dr. Jonathan yeah. Wright, we already held a yes. patent together on bioidentical hormones because he was my mentor in 1977 and is considered the father of bioidentical yes, hormones. Yes, he is. I've read many of his books. Yes. So he's been my mentor and my friend and my colleague all throughout my life. So John, Jonathan, I said, I want you to write me a script for bioidentical 2-MEO. And he said, what's the dosage? So we have to who knew? So I had to figure out the dosage. <laughs> yeah. And I've been on that for 20 years. Wow. And I've now put almost, I don't know, maybe 700 patients on it, but it's not FDA oh. approved. So to get a pharmacist to fulfill it, they're making themselves vulnerable. I'm making myself vulnerable. But we've had some extraordinary success combining it with some other things along with regular mm -hmm. care. The patients, my cancer patients that live the longest do the best of all worlds, allopathic care, functional right. care and add two methoxyestradiol and wow. some other things. Yes. And then I've been on regular hormones now, bioidentical hormones, which 
are thought to cause cancer, but in most cases, they actually protect against cancer. And that's what I want to talk about, yeah, right? So that's I mean, the deal. It, that's an incredible story. <laughs> as soon as story. I read that you're on 2MEX, whatever it's called, I was straight away Googling, where can I get this? You know, I'm just like, you I can't want to take it anywhere. No, it's I, I, very reali- hard to I get. realize that. Yeah. But aside from all that, which is just. Does it as, work on blood cancers too? Or just the tumor? Cancers. Interesting that you should ask. So a number of patients recently, especially of my friends, um, were diagnosed with very severe blood cancers. Mm-hmm. And I started to look in the literature. So there's what we call in vitro studies, studies in the laboratory on 2-MeO, not on humans, but enough worth the try because there's no adverse effect. It synergizes with radiation and chemo. It's not contraindicated. Wow. And and bioidentical does not make you nauseated like the patentable wow. altered form does, but you have to, you know, very few people know how to use it. So I ended up flying one week a month to Florida yeah. because my girlfriend was the medical director and she let me open up a breast cancer and yeah. renal clinic. And we were, all the compounders around the clinic agreed to make, to get a hold of 2MEO, to make it available for our patients. Wow. But I just stopped working there a month ago. Yeah, mm. so and, still and working now. She opened up her own practice in Sarasota, Florida. So people actually can still and see men her too. For I mean, it's it's, it's yes, a, it, it's helpful for both. Wow. Both of our bo- male and female bodies make this. It's one of the ways nature protects, you know, hormone action in the body. And can by it be having- like a preventative? If you've had cancer, like you had cancer after cancer. If you've had cancer and you maybe you're in remission or totally healed, but you want it as a preventative, is it a power? It would be a powerful preventative. Well, it is a prophylactic. It can be a yeah. prophylactic, and that's how I continue and why I continue to take it. But since I started to take it, I haven't. You know, I had. A, a fair number of tumors and I'm I'm minus a kidney, minus an adrenal gland, minus some parathyroid glands, minus the thyroid, oh. minus my female parts. I mean, normally oh. when you lose that many wow. um, organs, you're not a really vital person because huh. each organ has an energetic and contributes wow. to your overall health. So I have been on it prophylactically, but of course, every single time I go see my breast cancer doctor who has the best palpitating fingers. So if you, yeah. I don't want to get a mammogram every single year. Yeah. So they, um, they have great fingers because they palpate or feel breasts. And then they often go in and dissect those breasts. So they have very educated fingers. So yes. for, for um, 25 plus years, I've been seeing my cancer doctor and every single time I see her, she says, you look better than any single cancer patient I have. And you've got to go off hormones because that's <laughs> their mantra. Yes. Off hormones, off hormones. They're bad. They drive cancer. Oh. Be afraid of them. But yeah. take birth control pills. They're OK. Oh. You know, and that's what I want to get to in your book. You, uh, you, I want to quote you. Uh, you say many women upon hearing the word estrogen unconsciously cover their breasts with their arms and worry. Estrogen makes them think of the enemy breast cancer. Women, physicians, and scientists alike have come to equate estrogen with being a tricky and potentially dangerous player. And many contemporary doctors and oncologists regard estrogen as fuel for breast cancer. Can you, um, you know, those of us who kind of are into hormones and know, we know about the WHI study and how this started, but can you take us back before that yeah. to the history of er- estrogen therapy and, and bring us to the present? How did we get to the state where the Maybe the fear is being exposed as a fear now, but for a while it was God's truth. Like you, it does cause cancer. How do we come to that state and and go back to the beginning when estrogen I read in your book was used as a therapy for breast cancer, for goodness sake. Right, before Tamox, before Craig Jordan introduced tamoxifen, six milligrams daily of estradiol was used to treat metastatic breast cancer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, but nobody remembers that. And if you mention yeah. that to most doctors, you get the deer in the headlight look because they don't learn that in med school. Well, yeah. so so the reason that we even learned about hormones was basically from a wonderful British physician named Katerina Dalton. And in the 40s and 50s, she actually, she is the one who came up with the term premenstrual syndrome and started using progesterone, just felt that it was a progesterone insufficiency condition. And she was a forensic witness. And 
And there were a number of women who were on trial for murder for their husband or shaking their baby till it oh. died. And she established, in, I think about 128 women, one woman burned her home down. And she established this erratic, aberrant behavior was really because they had severe hormonal imbalances the last two weeks of the month and these crimes took place in the what's called the luteal phase the last two weeks of the month. Wow. And she ended up utilizing progesterone suppositories in the vagina from 600 to 900 milligrams a day and was able to get these women to have very calm personalities and be able to get them not landing in jail or on death row. Wow. And so hormones really started in England. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in the mid 50s, they took off. And in Europe, they've used more than natural forms of estrogen, yeah. estradiol, estriol, progesterone. They don't lean on as much of pharmaceuticals in the way they don't lean on as much litigious action. A lot of what's happened in the United States is the power of big pharma, but also the power of litigious action. If you, mm. if I go kayaking in a new state, I have to fill out 12 pages in the United <laughs> States. Right. But if you go zip lining in the Alps, my best friend who's a lawyer went last month in the Alps with her son and husband. They didn't have to sign any disclaimers to go zip lining in the Alps. <laughs> and the difference of what of the hormones that are used, in mm. my opinion, of yeah. course, all this is my opinion, right. is because of our big pharma and the way it supports all of our med schools and medical associations. They've mm. even been buying up naturopathic colleges and also because of litigiousness, because understandably, once you've worked so hard to gain a licensure and a degree, you get scared to death of losing it where there isn't that same level of fear in Europe, but it's starting to happen. So in the 50s and 60s, estrogen was very big in Britain. And then the United States started to do it, but we altered the molecules so they could be patented. And instead of using estradiol, which is exactly the same molecular structure as our own estrogen, we began to use horse estrogen, a pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, horses estrogen called conjugated equine estrogen or premarin and it would either be in that form as estrogen alone it would be swallowed whereas in europe it's most often put topically mm -hmm. on an arm or vaginally called, called the first vaginal pass and then um if we combine that with progestins the most common one used was medroxyprogesterone acetate, that was called Prempro. And Prempro and Premarin were the most popular selling drugs all the way up until 2002. And 18 to 20 million women in America were on these and they were promised to be feminine forever. And they were given to a lot of cardiac patients after you had a stint, after you had um, a heart attack, They women were encouraged to go on estrogen. We didn't see any adverse mm -hmm. results. They would have stopped it if they saw adverse results. So clinically, women were improved with their heart health, even if they had been a high risk woman because they just come through an adverse cardiovascular event. And so fast forward to the early 2000s, the United States is aging. Mm -hmm. And it's projected that in 2030, the majority of Americans will be over 65 and much less will be under 25. Wow. And the understandable fear is not to topple Medicare. So they came up with an idea because women live longer than men. On the average, women live 10 to 20 years longer than their husbands. And women live a third to a half of their life in menopause. And most women's health issues occur in the menopause, although that's kind of changing now that we have sicker and sicker, younger and younger people. In fact, mm. the rate of breast cancer has soared since 2015 wow. for women in their late 20s and really? up. Wow. wow. And I, the thought is due to a lot of endocrine disruptors right. in utero, but none of this is translated into clinical practice. So, I mean, what do you do about it? You can't mm -hmm. talk to your doctor about how to reduce endocrine disruption and your, your obstetrician isn't talking to you 
they should be the ones, of course, yes. talking about this. But um, uh, so they decided to come together with 40 prestigious institutions and run something called the Women's Health Initiative, or the nickname for that is the WHI, Women's Health Initiative. And they looked at women every which way. And the Women's Health Initiative has been an absolute debacle yeah. because one of their biggest, most astute studies that they did a beautiful job on was tracking women 65 and older because when women are on Medicare, we have all their records. We have all the details mm -hmm. of their records because the government pays for it. And they tracked from 220,000 women all the way to the women that were left living to be 90 years old and found that the women with the highest level of bad cholesterol had the less heart attacks, the less stroke, had the most ease of life, which was translated as less joint pain and mobility and still being active. But we've never changed the recommendation to go on statins if your cholesterol level is high in our aging women ever. So yeah. why did we even run it? And <laughs> then we decided the one of the first things we do would be two randomized trials on hormones because they thought that we'll prove with these randomized trials that hormones do everything we've been writing scripts for hormones for for women. They're good for heart disease, they're good for renal disease, they're good for lung projection, all this stuff. So we'll run two randomized trials, one with only oral conjugated equine or um, estrogen from a horse, Premarin, or the second one, the Prempro combo arm, which was the horse pregnant horse estrogen with a synthetic progestin. Now, they were supposed to run for eight years, both arms, the estrogen only arm, and the combo mm -hmm. arm. But within a few years, the combo arm was stopped because they thought they saw a few more cases of breast cancer, and they thought they saw a few more cases of bad heart issues, which were the very reasons they were recommending it, so they stopped it. Later on, it was discovered, and well, I'll go to, the methodology was found to be completely wrong, and when they reanalyzed the Women's Health Initiative, which they did, periodically throughout the next years. But in San Antonio, Texas, every year in December, they have a San Antonio breast cancer convention where scientists come from all over the world to share information to try and help women because most people are well-intentioned. They're not mm -hmm. trying to do something inappropriately on purpose. And at that convention, December 19th, 2019, they launched the reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative showing that when, when they reanalyzed all the data, that women were actually protected against breast cancer. And if they died, uh, if they had a recurrence of breast cancer, they died from it less. But let me go back to early mm. on, they stopped the combo arm. The estrogen only arm never showed. This is where it gets shocking. Yeah. I wrote a book on this called Safe Hormones, Smart Women, and I went into a deep dive and I write a sub stack every morning and wrote all this. Uh, Mercola did a terrible podcast bashing estrogen. Peter Atia did a, a podcast here in Austin bashing estrogen. And I sent out a, a rebuttal that's now been read by 100,000 people. And I tried to get on the shows to chat with them about it, but that was not meant to be. But the estrogen only arm never showed any increased risk of breast cancer ever. Yeah. And Leon Spiroff, who's written the gynecology and infertility book that everybody in medicine has for all their GYN courses, he started pumping out, he's considered the father of gynecology. Yeah. And he was a prof professor at the University of Portland where I went to school. He said, we know that hormones make women better. Don't take one little randomized trial and give it a chance because we're not seeing any of this in the estrogen only arm. And every few years they reanalyzed it. Naftalin, a huge statistician from Yale, reanalyzed everything. And he said, look at women on estrogen have less breast cancer, especially of even the worst kinds, lobular cancer, mm. and they die from it less if they get it. Estrogen mm. is breast protective. In fact, the 20 year reanalysis showed that if women are on an average, because the estrogen only arm was stopped at five years, so they only had the data for five years because a few women started to get more strokes because if you swallow estrogen, it, it goes through the digestive tract in the liver and it makes molecules that are more lumpy, clumpy, pro-coagulative. And mm. that's why we don't recommend long-term oral but nonetheless, um, 
never was the estrogen only arm shown to cause breast cancer at the 19 slash 20 year reanalysis presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium that the same authors of the original study of the WHI said, if a woman has been on estrogen for an average of five years, she reduces her risk of getting breast cancer in the first place by 23%. Wow. Just if incredible. she gets breast cancer, she reduces her risk of dying from it, of getting a serious, aggressive, poorly differentiated tumor by 44%. Oh. Nothing has ever been that yeah. breast protective. And yet, wow. what do we hear from doctors or what are they teaching now? Estrogen causes breast cancer. That's what the WHI proved. There's been so many articles now written yeah. in peer review saying that's not true. That's not yeah. what it showed. Why are we teaching that? In fact, med schools have stopped teaching hormonal meta menopausal medicine, and they recommend all these expensive medicines, these bisphosphonates mm. for bones yeah. and these poor safety profile medicines for cognition when hormones protect multiple tissues throughout the body. And everyone in my space is shaking their heads going, how did this travesty yeah. even occur? And it was seismic. Yeah. I mean, woman, yes. it, 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 it like, it affected the whole world. Well, probably more here in America, but it, it did not affect the whole world. Okay. No, not, not Europe. Europe said, what's wrong with those Americans? They did many, many surveys of gynecologists in Europe yep. who said, Americans are going to throw the hormonal baby out with the bathwater based on this one short little randomized trial when we now have since the 50s, incredible clinical understanding that women are helped. And in socialized medicine countries where they did extensive tracking of registries, so they have death registries, breast cancer registries, adverse cardiovascular event registries, where they track all their citizens, women on hormones get less cancers, get less adverse, cardi they have less stroke, mm. less heart attack, they have less dementia. When you read a study that says hormones cause dementia, it's because they have synthetic progestins yeah, in them yeah. or they're swallowed. So you have to really dive into the body. Right. You can't just throw out all the hormone water. So there's now about, I don't know the exact count, about 20, you're not going to believe this. There's about 20 socialized countries. Finland was the first. Britain joined two years ago on a sliding scale where if you become menopausal, they know that you'll cost the country so much less money, they offer you hormones for free for life. <laughs> wow, that's At incredible. At the same wow. time, we're denying them to women in the yeah. United States except birth control pills. So oh. no, it makes why no sense. is that? Oh, so, so Europe kept going, you know, America basically stopped, like, and then, right. you know, all those- Because uh, people got sued, and that's yeah. where the litigious arm added All the America. prescriptions for, you know, Prempro at the time went down, but all, at the same time, didn't all the, um, and the depression, anxiety oh, meds yeah. just surge, and I, right? And so many people too afraid right, of and estrogen. Right, and what's one, the yeah. number one benefit of going on hormones is you have better mood regulation. Right. You know, progesterone right. is powerful anti-anxiety yeah. right hormone. Yes. So Can many, I, so many right. of my friends are a little bit afraid of of well, actually a lot afraid of the estrogen, <laughs> but you know they think I just want to go natural. But then going natural means they're going to end up on these heart prescriptions and bone prescriptions and all of these other prescriptions so they're not really going natural at all they're just going on a, they'll have to choose a whole bunch more um helpers when we could just do but medicine's hormones. been so successful at marketing this that you're exactly right women are more comfortable with taking a statin yes. and or mm -hmm. an ang anti-anxiolytic med than they mm -hmm. are with taking a natural hormone. Yeah. And why would mother nature make the very hormone that drives humanity yeah. be pro-carcinogenic? It makes yeah. no sense. No, it doesn't. Well, exactly. uh, can I talk to you about the benefits? It's not just you know protecting us from breast cancer and reducing the risk. What does estrogen, but estradiol in, in particular, do for us women? Can, can you talk about its benefits in, a, in us? Well, actually, you know, it's all the hormones. The yes. hormones work as a symphony. Of course. And they all are nu in the nuclear family. So they're mm -hmm. in the family with thyroid hormones and mm -hmm. insulin hormones and yes. glucocorticoid hormones. Mm -hmm. And they all can affect 
they can function together and dysfunction together. So a really savvy hormone doctor will measure all those hormones yeah. yes. and not just measure one. Yeah. But we think of hormones as mainly sexy and reproductive things. But yeah. my last book was called Sexy Brain because your brain is completely dependent on hormones. You know, your hormones send emails to genes which hold all your archival information mm. and enable cells to know what to do to keep you well. And when you lose hormones, your email system freezes up Wow. And aging is basically your email system, your hormone system freezing up. So you have low hormones, increased inflammation, mm -hmm. and a third factor now, which we know is elevation of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, mm -hmm. which causes all the same symptoms Ooh, yes. as low estrogen, low testosterone, right. low progesterone. So I don't want to interrupt you, but is you that will. why in, 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 in late perimenopause, there's so much destruction to the brain? Like, like uh, I think it's, uh, what is that? The, Which is all reversible the factor that, if you that, go on hormones, right. unless you, you've gone to the end stage of true pathology, like Alzheimer's or Lewy body right. disease or something right, right. like that. Right. But there was that book. The, X, the XX Brain. Have yes. you, have you, are you familiar with that book by Dr. No, Lisa? No, what's the name of it? The, the XX, XX brain. brain. And they took pictures of premenopausal brains, late perimenopausal brains, and postmenopausal brains. And the perimenopausal brains looked very much like the postmenopausal brain, which this doctor was saying, don't wait to postmenopause until you start to seek some of this hormonal help because it's in that, especially the year before um, menopause, that a lot of this brain's decline happens. Um, memory but it's all reversible. Praise okay, God. Good. Unless you get to be to the non-reversible stage, yeah. which is, the, and not in your 80s or 90s, it's still somewhat reversible even oh. then if you don't have Alzheimer's or serious yeah. neurodegenerative disease. So based, I write about this somewhat in Safe Hormones, Smart Women and in Sexy Brain. It all started out at McGill University, the Department of Psychiatry, where they took functional MRIs of people who were becoming frail. Okay. And they talk slower. Most people 75 don't talk like me. No, 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 amazing. Oh my goodness. They, no. But I've been on hormones for almost three yeah. decades, but yes. I had breast cancer. Mm. So nobody yeah. would ever let any woman in the United States, yeah. no. at which all triple negative who have no hormonal receptors, why are they denied hormones, which is a whole nother conversation. But um, it, I bumped into the work of this uh, incredible researcher where she did functional MRIs showing that as we get more frail, we talk slower, we move slower, we forget things, we, we laugh about it, we make jokes about it, but we don't feel like ourselves. We gain weight around the middle, our bones are thinning, our, our kidneys aren't filtering the way they should filter. And she was able to show that that's occurring, overlapping with the hippocampal volume, which is really your physiologic analogy of your soul. It's where your memories are stored, your motivation occurs, your sense of self occurs. So when that shrinks right before Alzheimer's disease, you can't remember anything except long ago and you don't know where you are. And we have amber alerts for people like that mm -hmm. because their hippocampal volume is all shrunk up. But we now know, according to her work, she'd give shots of estrogen to women and testosterone, the same exact thing holds true for men. So it's exactly yeah. the same for both sexes. Yeah. And she was able to revolumize the hippocampus at specific dosages of hormones. Mm. And then the people, it would re wheel back like Benjamin buttoning, where they would end up standing taller, projecting wow. stronger, moving faster. So a lot of aging is reversible, but you mm. can, if you speak to a gerontologist in the United States, you won't have this conversation. No, They're not trained in this. They're trained that there's no yeah. uh, answer for Alzheimer's disease. And you're disease. saying there's hope all the way up to a proper, like you're, you're really in the Alzheimer's disease. Like up until then, you're like, you can reverse this. You know, we get a lot of questions too by a woman saying, well, I, you know, I'm 67 now. Am I just too late to go on No, hormones? you're never too late. Yeah. We've yeah. started, pe that whole idea of the estrogen window. And I know yes. that uh, um, there was Rhonda Patrick and somebody else on the Peter Atia show saying, 
And I had I had the Harvard gynecologist on my show, and then I didn't even publish it because so much data that he discussed was inaccurate, wrong, biased. That estrogen window is a theory. It's a theory yeah. of one arrogant guy that wrote an incredibly <laughs> successful book on it and promoted it. And it's not accurate because in practice, we put women in their 90s on yeah. hormones, in their 80s on, but you, it's done a different way yes. Yes. by somebody who's younger because they're receptors right. that are satellite dishes that take the information function differently so it has to be done, approached very very differently um but really the doctor who's done the, the scientist who's done the most to prove that your hippocampus is revolumable rebootable i guess you could say you could reboot it so you could have what do you call it when you have um sequel two and sequel yes, three yes yes part two <laughs> <laughs> right and his name is Dale Bredesen, and he's yeah. a neurologist from UCLA, and he has been able to publish in peer review and train thousands of medical doctors who've replicated his work by taking people with mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease. He's written two best-selling books, one's called The End of Alzheimer's, and the other one is called The End of Alzheimer's Program, I think. And it starts, there's a list of things to do at top is oh, hormones. Oh, we're getting it. At the top is hormones. Wow. But then there's multiple other yes, things yes, to do because yes. cognitive decline is also thought to be kind of a type 3 diabetes and yes. it does dietary mm -hmm. intervention. But nonetheless, he has trained doctors. I only had six patients and utilized his protocol. And just like he said, within three to six months, people didn't need a, a helper. They were able to go back to work. They didn't oh. need a cane. But he is not accepted in the United mm. States. And that's because he's not promoting a pharmaceutical. Right. Mm. And I think it's time for people to wake yes. up and get really angry about this. Get I do really too. angry about this and help change it. Yeah. It's, I it's agree. Pain. And that's why you're here. And that's why you, we're having you on our podcast this needs to come out yes. and and you know thank we, you for this opportunity and, to have and, this and we have um, hundreds of thousands of women listening and if they take this information and take it to their doctors you know we are a powerful force yes. we women and i believe we can change the face of healthcare. i oh, do i totally agree i mean yes our listeners are especially powerful <laughs> <laughs> but can we talk about what changes to our heart when we go through menopause? And, and you know, women are, are very protected usually from, from heart disease before we lose our estrogen. And then we go on blood pressure medicine. I mean, if, unless we do hormones. Can you talk about what, what is this protection that estradiol gives us? The basic cell of the heart is called the cardiomyocyte. And estradiol protects the mitochondria, which has higher executive functioning over the cardiomyocyte, Estrogen protects it. It kind of rules the health of the heart. Mm. And also testosterone does because the heart is a muscle and testosterone helps maintain health of muscles in the body. So in men, estrogen also maintains the health of the heart. And we measure all the estrogens in a man that wants to get hormones or has heart disease. And we want to make sure that it's in an optimal level, not too much. So he's feminized uh -huh. and it's too high in ratio to his male hormone testosterone, but it's adequate enough so that his mm. cardiomyocyte is protected. And we know that estrogen protects against heart disease because premenopausal women tend to have much less heart, if any, much less mm. heart disease. And when, as soon as a woman loses hormones, she starts having the same yeah. risk of these adverse cardiovascular events as men. Doesn't so what do we usually yeah. pass on to the next incarnation from, from heart disease, from a heart attack or stroke? So to deny a woman the benefit of being on hormones, because even they're exogenous, they're scripted hormones, yeah. they protect your heart just in the same way that your own hormones protect your heart. You know, can I just... Yeah, go oh, ahead. Girl, you'll be so mad for si that it I'm going to sidetrack you slightly. I know, it makes it hard not to grind my teeth to powder. <laughs> no, I'm going to sidetrack slightly and my sister's probably going to kick me underneath this coffee table. But we mentioned testosterone, we mentioned men, and I just want, I know that, you know, you're all about um, estrogen and breast cancer. You're all about the whole hormones too. But because you've been probably around a lot of peers, um, if you don't know this, I'm sure you know somebody who does know this. I, I mean, 
we, we kind of understand now that testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer, you know, and it's a crime. No, but it's they, exactly yeah, the, the same op- thing. And right. men on testosterone, if they get prostate cancer, they die from it less. And mm-hmm. Abraham Morgenthaler is, was an associate professor of urology at Harvard. And he and I lectured together about a year ago in Miami, and it took me forever to get him on my show. But I wanted him on my show because it's exactly the same for men. And he would say exactly the same thing. Why would Mother Nature make the very hormones that run men and women and the evolution of men and women be hormones that cause cancer. If this was yes. true, we'd see much more cancer the younger we are what when if, we have more hormones. What about if a man like has um, the enlarged prostate, it's not cancerous at all? You know, no, that's benign prostatic the, hypertrophy. Yes, and no. the doctor won't prescribe testosterone just because it's enlarged, but it's not going to turn that enlarged. Really? They, that's, a, that's a risk factor that they won't prescribe? I did not know that. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, it, but the worst thing is, is that Dr. Morgenthaler, who started the Boston's Men Clinic and has been on this mission, and he just retired, though, he's been on this very same mission. He would find that if men had prostate cancer or if they had stroke, and if you're on hormones and you get either of those things, your doctors are going to say the hormones cause yes, it, right. which oh, yeah. is not true. Right. Yeah. And he said that as soon as you get back and you're done with the treatment and you get back on the hormone, it reduces your risk of a recurrence and it reduces your risk of death. Oh. If you do get recurrence, it's exactly the same statistics mm-hmm. as estrogen in women, which makes sense. Yeah. But if you talk to most doctors, you will get the wrong answer yeah. because they are not teaching this in med school and they're so successful at this marketing it's shocking yeah it is fa- because it is. it's successful yeah um i would like to talk about a big topic with women that are going through late perimenopause postmenopausal it's the thickening of our waistlines that can occur as our hormones decline um our the body the female body can can change what 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 is happening with that when we lose estrogen uh, and the waist wants to thicken and there's more belly fat and do you it's a two part question do you think um using estrogen can reverse that or prevent it oh definitely i see it all the time in practice mm-hmm. um so there's two three factors so what i said earlier so if you get a lowering of estrogen in women or a lowering of testosterone in males which increases inflammation. When you have unoccupied hormone receptors, you have wow. more inflammation. And inflammation, huh. the inflammatory molecules, they're, they're actually called cytokines, they literally deposit more fat on your middle. And then the more fat you have, visceral fat, not under the skin, but between organs, those also send out nasty cytokines. So I have a big article that's for free. Anyone can go to my website, drlindsayberkson.com and read this blog called Bigger Belly, Smaller Brain, because these cytokines travel in your bloodstream, hit the brain, and they shrink the hippocampus, and they also shrink your gray matter. So these bigger bellies that you have worsen your outcome for cognition. And, And the third thing that makes for the thicker waist that you don't want nobody feels better with a thicker waist and a lot of my girlfriends feel like the difference between heaven and hell is two or three pounds you know you don't feel better when you gain more weight you feel much better when you can successfully lose weight and keep it off the third factor is this elevation of fsh fsh is low in premenopausal women Mm -hmm. And when it elevates in aging men and women, again, this is this, Mm. it's all the same in both genders. We're all of the same homo sapien race. When FSH goes up, it causes more thicker waist and fat on the gut. It causes brain fog. It causes bone loss. It causes many of the things that the lower sex hormones cause. And we so now know, but not a lot of doctors know, because this is research from the last five or seven years. And I wrote about this in an article that's available called Fat Cells Heart thing is the fat cell can't live with them and can't live without them in the Townsend newsletter in January of 2023. Um, That's why I know a lot of this information because I write so much, (laughs) but they have now come out with pharmaceutical drugs, a monoclonal antibody to bind up with that FSH and make it ineffectual for weight loss, for brain fog, for bone health. They're again, another drug when actually giving yeah. estrogen to a woman and testosterone mm. to a man lowers it. And it's one of the ways we track if you're on hormones to the best 
dosage, not yes. just where you get rid of hot flashes and sleep yes. better and get rid of anxiety. Yes. But if you really, really, really uh, are lowering your FSH below 35 or ideally even below 25, then we know you're really getting better estrogen or testosterone depending on your, and we give testosterone to females too, because mm -hmm. maleness protects femaleness and testosterone yeah. is a anti-breast cancer hormone. Oh, and, I didn't know um, that one. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. Testosterone is now given quite a bit. It's got it's the most peer reviewed right. by Rebecca Glasser and Dr. Dimitra Kakis of giving uh, testosterone to ER positive breast cancer patients right after diagnosis. But they also use an aromatase inhibitor with it. But um, so as soon as you lower FSH, you're having less signals to give you a thicker waist and you have better cognition and you have hormone receptors on your vocal cords, your lungs, your, your kidneys. Um, whenever I get a pedicure, my uh, little lady that works on me, she always goes, you have such good voice. I can hear you. <laughs> All my little old oh, ladies, I can't hear them. Right. And I just was lecturing in Detroit yeah. for nine hours last Saturday. You have to have good projection, vocality, yes. vocal cords, which hormones give you on all those organs. Oh, it's just incredible. <laughs> I is love a fire hydrant. I'm just sitting underneath it and just drinking and drinking. <laughs> yes, I didn't know it was FHH. Yes. FSH kind of have its, has its own negatives. I didn't know that. I thought it was just the lowering of the, you know, the hormones. Wow. Okay. That's... You know, heart, you, hardly anybody knows this. <sighs> so one of the main teachers at A4M, where I'm often an associate professor, which is a five-year course to take a doctor or nurse practitioner and get them over a number of years board certified in functional medicine. She was just asked recently, D does FSH mean anything? Should we track it? And she said, no, it doesn't mean anything because you have to know this. You have yes. to, un and it, what you don't mm. know is what gets you. Yes. You know, yes, and that's exactly. why knowledge is power. Yeah. But then if you have this power, who, which doctor do you go to to get yeah. the scripts that also knows this information? Yeah. So actually, um, on February 15th, I've asked three of my colleagues that have been in the hormone space for 30 years each, if not more, we're giving a free talk the night after Valentine's Day called Let's Talk Estrogen, Safe, Dangerous, oh, Let's cool. Talk. Yeah. And I'll give you that link that you Please. can, it's all for free, but you have to sign up ahead of time to get yeah. a seat. Yes. And then I've been teaching, so I'm teaching a two-day online course with David Brownstein, one of the most famous mm. hormone doctors we have in the United States from Bloomfield, Michigan. I also went to the University of Michigan. He and his wife did too. But we're teaching a two-day online course for CMEs, for MDs, and nurse practitioners for everything hormones, exactly what to know to start prescribing them and yeah. tracking them Monday morning. And then I'm teaching oh, uh, in the fall with David Rosensweet, a three-day in person course in Oak Brook, Illinois, also to MDs and nurse practitioners. So we're trying to teach, 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 teach to do away with the ig ignorance and the fear, but doctors are so frightened that they're really still say, well, I'm scared to death to give it. What if I, right. the woman gets breast cancer? So we have a disclaimer for the patient to write yeah. informing them that if you do get breast cancer of doing on hormones, you're in a better shape than if you weren't because you'll have lower risk of dying yes. from it. It actually puts you in a better situation. Yes. It's not a worse situation. Yes. So we've been teaching, 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 teaching to try and offset the tide of fear and what's mm -hmm. not been dealt with by the med schools because they're sponsored by big pharma. Right. So true. You know, women <laughs> are, I'm, I'm beating you on this one. Um, <laughs> women are fearful, but not only that, that, they're confused, but they're desperate. The biggest question we have gotten is, Pearl and Serene, help us with our hormones. Who do we trust? Who do we right. trust? Especially who do they trust if they already have cancer or they've got a history of cancer in the intermediate, like all their sisters had it or their mother. So like, so the first thing we want is for them to read your book, Estrogen yeah. Vindicate, and get the fear off. But then they need to find these um, physicians that will continue to treat them. Because oftentimes, yes. even places that are great, 
if you've already got it they're yeah a we are we are you know we've had this question so much that we are you know we've worked on this for years we're actually coming out with it. it's called kiora our own um we're not but linking up with doctors that uh, we'd love to have you involved that that are going to be uh Tr- treating properly with hormones, women all around this country. And thyroid, but everything. We don't all know them. There's who very, to tr- very, very few of them. Yes. Because yeah. when you do, you put yourself on the litigious yes. vulnerability path. And that is the issue. This, how do, is how do these the women, issue. though, that may be hearing this podcast, they actively have cancer or, or, they it's, had it. or they've had it or it's they in their family. They won't be able to get hormones from most doctors, so you'd have to no. work with some. So how do so they find example, those particular so, amazing uh, well, people out there who will treat them? How do they find that? How, where well, do they Dr. go? Dr. Brownstein, Dr. Rosensweet, the, four, the three of us doctors that will be on Let's Talk Estrogen, okay. all of us have, have a history over the last 10 years of giving hormones to breast cancer patients, but only with the blessing of their oncologist because you yeah. don't want to get everything caught in the middle. So I spend hours on the phone oh, yeah. with oncologists. I was just speaking job. yesterday. It's horrible and I never charge oh. for it. I had oh. a patient who's triple negative stage four with a horrific met in her buttock. She's absolutely has intractable pain. None of the fentanyl patches work. Oh. And so I said, let me speak to your um oncologist who happens to be one of the head oncologists at a major cancer center in Duluth, Minnesota. And to this oncologist's credit, she came on the phone and we spent a half hour. I went over this research with her. I talked to her about it and she agreed to write the scripts. If you can get the oncologist to agree, the oncologist can even write the scripts. And usually what I do is I follow it up with an in-depth email and I write the scripts out and I give some of the background and some of the eBooks, you know, for my website, my eBook on my website called hormones for breast cancer survivors is meant for patients to hand to their oncologist. Thank you. And some oncologists call me up and are glad to have the conversation. And some go, who the hell do you think you are Mm. and don't want to deal with us? You never know how it's going to be. Okay. So we we have women ask us Mm. all the time, you know, that have had breast cancer, but I can't do that. But I would love to do that. But we're going to send them to your website. They're going to download that little ebook. What is it called? Can you say that again? So the ebook that you're talking about is... uh, that estrogen vindication, which gives you yeah. kind of the summary of the safety of estrogen. Yeah. And there's two theories of what causes breast cancer or cancer. One is that hormones drive it. And the other one is that cancer stem cells drive it. And cancer stem cells, which is, I think, the more reasonable theory, have no receptors for hormones, have nothing to do huh. with hormones. And there's a wonderful book by an oncologist who thinks exactly this way. And he wrote a book that everybody should get, yes. which I think I cite in my book, Estrogen Vindication. And it's called Estrogen Matters by Dr. Avram Bloomy. I, I tell the, I tell a woman yeah. to get that too. I love it. Yes. The thing that's crazy is that before estrogen got dissed, in July 9th, 2002, with the Women's Health Initiative, the first Women's Health Initiative, mm-hmm. inappropriately. Mm-hmm. Up until then, there were 26 studies where they gave women who were just diagnosed with ER positive breast cancer estrogen. And they tracked them. One study was 30 years long. One study was run by Dr. Avon Blooming. And that study was, I don't know where, I think it's still ongoing. It's 24, 25, 26 years. Some of the studies were from MD Anderson. Some of the studies were the University of Wisconsin. And a few of the studies were outliers in other countries. But the majority of them were done by prestigious institutions in the U.S. with matched cohorts of women with ER positive breast cancer who went on placebo and didn't go on estrogen. Mm -hmm. 26 studies, some 30 years long. Not one of these studies saw women have any worse, higher rate of recurrence. (laughs) <laughs> Not one of uh, these studies showed women having um, more death if they had recurrence. And in all of them, women had a much higher quality yeah. of life. But none of these studies are known. So I went through all of these 26 studies at a presentation at the International College of Integrative Medicine in Dearborn, Michigan, two years ago. And I had so many doctors in that audience say, that's it. Next week, I'm writing scripts for women with breast cancer. That's it. And I have a membership for 
uh, physicians. And actually, right now, we're talking about treatment of breast cancer. So Friday, I'm giving a talk going through all of these studies. Wow. And if you see these studies, it changes your mind. Yes. But medical doctors don't have access to these yeah. studies. So why are we doing these studies? Wow. I, I, it's, it's so... <laughs> Well, um, I you, wouldn't be who I am today yes. if I wasn't on yes. hormones, yet I yes. had breast cancer 30 years ago. Wow. Yet nobody would give it to me if I didn't have an in on right. my own. It's right. not fair. It, it is not fair. fair. It is not fair. And, <sighs> yeah. you know, the, th the what are the three killers of women, right? I mean, it's it's heart disease. Mm -hmm. It is uh, brain, uh, brain diseases. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then it's not really known, but fractures kill a lot of women oh, and then it's written down a stroke right but it but it but what they broke a lot of women well, fractures you know once they oh, get fractures. a hip there's like once you get the hip break then you know, you know the hip break is not the reason on the death certificate no. but then it was stroke because they were laying on their back for a long time or something like that and these these are directly linked to the the loss of our sex hormones yeah so, um, yeah, we just want to thank you so much. I, I want to say the name of, is that where people are going to go, the name of your website, just drberritson.com? So I'm going to send you, if you tell me where, yes. you send me an email. Sure. So I know, because you should get that Let's Talk Estrogen free yes, evening. Yes. It's an hour and a half. We, right, and yeah. the last half hour will be Q&A for practitioners. So invite all of your own practitioners. Yes. Okay. If you want to get hormones, yes. invite your own practitioners and yourself and your girlfriends and your husbands to this talk, Wonderful. which is February 15th at 7 p.m. Central. And I'll send you that. And so I'll send you my link to my website, which is Dr. Lindsay L I. N D S E Y Berkson B E R K S O N dot com. If you're interested in the membership, I have I write every morning in Substacks. You can scroll down on the first page and see that I have a one, two, and three level, and I'm constantly writing. I make myself at the mid level available once a month where you can ask me anything, talk about anything, bring up anything. This drive this and then purpose I've got a pro level it. where I train, we go over cases. Because I don't know if I'm going to drop dead next week, and I want to share all this information. <laughs> well, you don't look like yeah. you will. I'm signing up for From that. Your yes. lips to God's ears. Oh, I'm signing up for your membership. <laughs> Me I didn't too. even know about it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. This um, has been a true treat. Because, you know, we, we're so nerdy about hormones. It's, it's, it's our favorite subject in life. And this to us so is So are you been guys on hormones? Oh, you yes. bet we are. Yeah, I'm on injections of estrogen and estradiol. <laughs> or, uh, we, we, are, are, we are optimized on How hormones. How old are you guys? Do you mind oh, me asking? Yeah, I'm, I'm 47. And I'm 53. So Okay, you look fabulous. Oh, well, you look in your mid-30s. You. Oh, yeah. you're too <laughs> kind. But, you know, I start, I'd always been interested in hormones and was a geek and I loved studying about them. But then when it came to menopause I got scared you know because of the fear because of the breast cancer thing and um and I didn't do it I didn't do it for the first year I went post menopause and I was feeling so terrible I was I felt like a different person I felt flat inside I was having hot flashes and I said right I'm gonna do it I'm gonna I well, found she, I remember you saying to me I have to tell myself that the sky is blue and that tree is is a glorious tree outside of my kitchen window but then when she got on hormones she's like I have to tell myself nothing. The sky is just beautiful. Like I, it's like I don't have to mind over matter joy. Well, but you know, I did it in the end because the hot flashes were were not letting me sleep. I'm I'm a person that had so many hot flashes. They they left. Okay, that was fine. But it was all the other benefits. My brain, the way I feel, my muscle tone coming back, my metabolism coming back. I want to scream hormones to the world. And, and Pearl told me, you know, I was in um, perimenopause, and she's like, Pearl. Like Serene, little sister, if there's one thing I would have done differently is I wouldn't have waited yeah. till one year post menopause. I would have just jumped on the train in Perry because then you don't have to go through all of that downward Well, spiral. actually, the earlier you start, yes. the longer your benefit. And if you start within five years of the 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 later perimenopause and early menopause, you actually protect an area in the brain which re highly reduces your risk of stroke. Wow. wow. So incredible. In your 80s. Wow. Oh. And that's what we learned from the reanalysis is that the benefits of a few years of hormones keep going on. They only tested it 20 years out, but they know that hormone benefits go decades out after you do even a few years of hormones. Wow. So it's actually, since most women 
most human beings, the number one cause of death is heart disease. It's mal it should be malpractice not to consider it, but almost everybody, I hear over and over again when women ask their well-intentioned gynecologists, yeah. am I a candidate for hormones? And they'll go, I don't believe in hormones. Yeah. But hormones aren't a religion. <laughs> they're not Muslimism. They're not Christian. Yeah. They're, they're a physiologic fact. And the problem is, is that they, and anyone that's labeled high risk is told they shouldn't have hormones. You could have yeah. an aunt that has a genetic pro- coagulative disorder yeah. and they tell you you're high risk. So much of that is inaccurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you could even have a, a clumping blood disorder yourself like factor five yeah. Leiden. But if you just take your hormones topically or vaginally, you yeah. actually are better off wow. and avoid the risk of stroke compared to if you swallow it. So yeah. to tell you, I just want to say one more thing because it's so exasperating. It's so inbred, this misunderstanding of the literature that even the best intentioned published peer review scientists slash physicians can often get it wrong. So one of the more famous, incredible women is the woman uh, giving testosterone to breast cancer patients because we know testosterone is very, cancer's growth out of control and growth controllers protect the breast. And wow. testosterone is a tremendous growth controller or an wow. anti-proliferative agent in the breast. So there's one physician that's been doing all kinds of research to show that testosterone can be safely given to women right after a diagnosis of breast cancer, even ER positive. So we invited her to be on wow. the Let's Talk Estrogen. Well, she said, no, I'm against, against estrogen. Estrogen actually promotes breast cancer. So she sent us the studies that she said supported, and she's a lovely human yes, being and done yeah, amazing work. She sent us the studies that she felt supported this position. But if you didn't just read the abstract, which is that was what the abstract said, and yeah. you're a geek like I am like you are, and we dug into the studies, these studies actually had the synthetic progestins or uh -huh. they were oral, they were the, yeah. again, it was that issue. But if you divided them out, the women just on estrogen had protection, wow. whereas the women with the combo product had it worse, but they were all clumped together. So even she, with all the phenomenal work and elbow grease that she's done for breast cancer patients and women, didn't catch those caveats that strangle our information and make wow. doctors alike and women scared of hormones. So. Mm this is why we try and teach doctors, how, how do you read a scientific study? Right. How do you read graphs and statistics? And what are the really bugaboos of hormones? And what are the protective aspects of hormones? And how might you look at that in a patient? And these yeah. are things that, that they don't have access in their training. So when women ask their doctor, 99% of the time, they get the wrong answer. They say, I don't believe in hormones. They're yeah. high risk. You shouldn't take them. They're not worth it. Go get some herbs, exercise more. Now, one other final thing, and I'll shut up. No, no I love it. <laughs> We're supposed to have quit, but no, you just well, keep is, going. This is amazing. <laughs> well, because well, I've been lecturing on hormones now for decades, you know, and I've written 21 books of which many of them are on hormones. So if I don't know hormones, somebody <laughs> should come and spank me on the bottom. <laughs> so everyone thinks if you exercise and eat well, uh, you know, it, or let's say you're mindful and uh -huh. you meditate, yeah. you should have as good an age uh, an older age as hormones. So Yale wanted to know, is this true? And they said, again, the true sign of aging is the volume of your hippocampus. Okay. So wow. they decide they did a study called the med X study and med stands for meditation and X stands for exercise. And it was an extraordinary study. Two years, they just published the results. I read all the data every morning. I go through the, that's, and I published that in Substack so everyone could read. So if you want to join my Substacks, I really think you should. I should. No, I'm, I'm going, going tomorrow to. morning, I'm going to be there. It's called yeah. Agile Thinking okay. by Berkson. So right. um, they did functional MRIs, just like originally was found years ago in that woman that gave estrogen with functional MRIs, she could revolumize the volume of the hippocampus by giving estrogen. Yeah. So they gave people a very intensive meditation regime and exercise regime, and they had to come to a place where there were uh, people that oversaw them doing this. So they couldn't just 
fill out a survey right. and said they did it. They had to yeah. show up and do yeah. it. So for two years, they extensively exercised yeah. and extensively meditated while they tracked the volume of the hippocampus, which is where we live, our soul, yes. our memory, our motivation, yeah. our orientation in space. And every single month, it just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because even exercise, so the women who say, I'm going to go through, me if nature meant for me yes. to yeah. be younger, longer, then she'd give me hormones longer yeah. and I'm going to age naturally. Yeah. But if you live 20, 30 years with your hippocampus shrinking, yeah. you're not the same person and your future isn't what you might. And this isn't true for everyone. Once in a while, there's women who aren't on hormones and they do phenomenal. Yeah. So, you know, nothing's 100 percent. But that was an extraordinary study wow. that showed that extensive, moderate to vigorous exercise and meditation did not maintain this volume of the, of the hippocampus. Wow. But if you give hormones within a few weeks in a three month trial, they were able to show that hormones could start to revolumize. In weeks, hormones start to revolumize wow. the hippocampus if you're not to severe Alzheimer's or, yes, or yeah. a severe neurodegenerative disease. So this is information that is just not known. Mm -hmm. And I so appreciate the opportunity that your listeners can kind of come in on us talking about this and they can you know, sit with it, marinate on it and decide what's right for them but don't let a wrong answer really detour you away yeah. from a better future if you decide to work with someone, but it all depends on also who you work with. But that was my final thing that I, I love wanted it. to say. Oh <laughs> boy, that we have loved this so much. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. We would love thank to you. have you on anytime yes. if you would grace us again. Thank you so much. Oh, I have my new book coming out. It's on oxytocin, the orgasm oh, hormone. And okay. I would love to chat on that. That yes. is fascinating. Definitely. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> bye bye. Blessings. And bye. Blessings thank you for all the work that you guys do and oh. for how gorgeous and vital you look. Oh. I so appreciate it. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you.